Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Martin Harrer. Uh, Martin, as you know, is a professor at Imperial College. And before that, he was at Warwick. Uh, and previously, he was at the Courant Institute, right? Uh, he mainly works on stochastic dynamics, analysis of stochastic PDEs, and he's received numerous awards, including the Fields Medal, the Breakthrough Prize, and the Fermat Prize. So, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, so, the work I want to talk about today is well. You see the title here, so it's directed mean curvature flow in noisy environment. And it's a joint work with uh, my former PhD students, Andres Garasimovic and Konstantin Matetsky. Uh, Andres, fortunately, left academia and now works for a bank, but Konstantin is uh, a Columbia at the moment. Um, and so, so let me try. So the plan is to basically, you know, explain to you what the pro what the problem is, sort of try to explain, uh, I'm going to spend quite some time sort of explaining what the main result is. Um, and we're going to do a sort of few formal calculations to sort of, you know, check whether this is sensible or kind of reasonable. Um, and, and then I'm going to, you know, spend some time sort of trying to explain bits and pieces of what the difficulties are that arise and sort of what's the sort of tricks that we use to solve them. Um, so, so the problem is the following. So you take, okay, so let's start with mean curvature, right? So the mean curvature flow in two dimensions. So this is all going to be in two dimensions, uh, which really means that you're looking at the evolution of a one-dimensional sort of interface. And so in general, in two dimensions, mean curvature is the following. So you have a, you know, say a curve um, and now at every point, and this evolves in time. Uh, and so now what you do is at every instant of time, you look at any point of the curve, uh, you look at, you know, the circle that kind of matches as closely as possible here. Uh, so then that gives you curvature. So the curvature is sort of one over the radius of that circle, right? Um, and so kappa, if you want, is one over the radius. Um, and now the way the curve evolves is that at every point it moves in the normal direction at speed given by kappa, right? And the way this typically evolves is it's, it's kind of a smoothening flow, right? So it kind of smoothens things out because what you can kind of imagine uh, if you start off with something that looks like, for example, sort of like a square or so something that has corners, right? Then here at these points, sort of the curvature is actually infinite, right? So you should think of these corners as being a tiny bit rounded, right? And so then the curvature would be not quite infinite, but just very large. Uh, and that means that these corners, they actually move in sort of super fast, uh, whereas everything else here sort of moves in at speed one. Uh, and so what this actually gives you is that at any positive instant of time, if you, even if you start with something with corners, you sort of end up with something where the corners are smoothened out, right? So it sort of looks like that a little bit later. Um, and then even later, it would sort of look like this and eventually kind of looks more or less like a circle and the circle sort of shrinks to a point. Um, and actually this would even vanish in finite time, right? Um, so now what we are going to look at is mean curvature flow, but which is directed I'm going to say in a second what I mean by that, and noisy. And I'm also going to explain in which way <clears throat> we make it noisy. And we're actually going to make it sort of weakly noisy. Uh, so first directed just means that instead, so you have still your curve uh, and now the speed here is not given by the curvature, but it's say given by curvature plus one. Okay, 
Uh, so if you think of the mean curvature flow as coming from, you know, something like level sets of Alan Kahn or some other sort of phase field sort of equation, uh, then you would have a potential and the mean curvature flow corresponds to sort of a symmetric potential and directed mean curvature flow would sort of correspond to a potential that kind of looks like this, uh, where one side is a little bit more stable than the other one. Right, and so the um, the interface wants to go in the stable direction. Uh, it wants to go in the unstable direction. Right, so the stable guy wants to expand, and the unstable guy sort of contracts. Uh, so in this case, that would be the situation where this side here is stable, and this side here is unstable. Um, so that's the directed bit. And the noisy bit or weakly noisy is that actually we imagine that this whole thing takes place in an environment which is itself random and affects the speed of that interface, right? So you should imagine that here uh, you have sort of noise, right? So the, the environment here is not completely homogeneous uh, but it's kind of noisy. Um, and that noise at any given point sort of affects the speed of the interface at that point, right? So, so then what this means is, well, so the noise, say we describe it by some random field eta of say x, y, um, and then it affects the speed by just having, well, so first we make it weakly noisy. So we put a small parameter in front. Uh, so let me just draw it like that. So I've got some space. So we put one plus the curvature at, say if you're at a point X. So the curvature of course depends on the curve U. So say U here is the curve uh, and then we put a small parameter in front of the noise and the noise depends on X of say X, Y, this would be the point X, Y. Okay, so that's the model. And now the question is, what can you say about the behavior of that directed noisy mean curvature flow in particular, what can you say about it for sort of large times, right? So of course you can do, right, since you have this square root of epsilon, of course you could just sort of look at what happens at times of order one and maybe do some kind of expansion in epsilon. Uh, that's not what we want to do. We are interested in what happens at very large times. And so of course, if you want to look at very large times, right, if the curve that you start with is sort of order one, then, well, if there weren't any noise at all, it would just shrink to a point in times of order one, right? And so then of course, there's nothing interesting happening at large times because the curve would just disappear. Right? And so what we do instead is we start with something like a flat curve, right? So imagine that you take a curve, which is essentially flat, sort of like that. Right. And so now, well, and make it either infinite or actually what we're going to do is we make it sort of very large and we put the whole thing onto, onto a big cylinder. Um, but that sort of technical details, think of it as just being like an infinite, essentially flat line. Um, and then again, it moves by, by mean curvature. So here that would be the graph of a function it doesn't necessarily remain the graph of a function, but clearly it's going to remain the graph of a function for some time, right? Um, and again, the normal speed is mean one plus mean curvature plus small noise. Um, and now you can look at what happens at very large times, right? So if there weren't any, uh, if there weren't any noise and this is sort of sufficiently flat, then it would basically stay flat and it would just move up at speed essentially one, right? 
So if you start with something very flat, it just moves up at speed one. Uh, and so nothing terribly interesting happens. Um, but the point is since we have this noise around here, um, that's going to, even if you start with something completely flat, right, which in the deterministic case would simply move at speed one and that's it, nothing else. Um, well, because of the noise, it would actually start to exhibit some fluctuations. And then what you're interested in is, you know, figuring out what these fluctuations are. Okay, so here we're looking basically at fluctuations around the flat curve. Um, in principle, you could look also at fluctuations around something which isn't quite flat on, you know, very large scales. But for simplicity, we essentially consider, we consider the case where you start with something which is essentially flat. It doesn't need to be completely flat, but it should be essentially flat uh, over pretty large scales. Um, so the sort of, right, so here the kind of real world, if you want, scenario that you can have in mind is something like this, right? So, so that some sort of a bushfire, you have that flame front here, that would be, your curve, um, it's directed because it's going to move basically in this direction, right? So here it's burned on this side and it's not burned on this side. So it's basically going to move in this direction. Um, there's going to be some sort of curvature effect. It's not, maybe mean curvature is maybe not a great model for that particular case. Uh, our results are actually a bit more general than that. So it could probably also accommodate sort of more realistic kind of flame front models. Um, and here it's noisy because basically some bits sort of burn faster than others, right? Sort of like the, the one that appears here would be something like the average speed at which uh, that flame front sort of burns its way through the bush. Um, and these are sort of fluctuations that just describe the kind of local behavior um, of the bush and that tell you that some bits are going to bur burn a little bit faster, some bits are going to burn a little bit slower, right? Um, so, so the point here is that, right, so we look at this particular uh, regime where things are essentially flat and the noise is actually quite weak, right? So this is different from, so there's been, there's some literature, so there's a number of people, uh, for example, Röger and Weber and various co-authors, uh, and also von Renesse and several co-authors. So there's a number of people who sort of try to define noisy mean curvature flow, where, you know, the mean curvature flow acts on things that are curved on scales of order one, and the noise acts, if you want, on the same sort of scales and this of size of order one, uh, that's not what we're doing here, right? So here we're taking some asymptotic where things are almost flat um, and the noise is very weak. So if we, so let me just write down the equation that you get, right? So just to get some idea of what we're actually talking about. Oh, and here just in terms of technical things, I have to say something about that noise, right? Uh, so this eta here, we're going to assume that eta is Gaussian um, and that it has, say, short range correlations. Think of it as, for example, saying that the covariance, the correlation function is either compactly supported or with sort of sufficiently fast decay. Uh, and it's smooth. Okay, so this is assumed to be as smooth as you want. Okay, so that noise, these fluctuations, they are kind of smooth at these scales. Uh, they're Gaussian and they are essentially, they have short range correlation, which basically means that you should think of it as being essentially independent once you get that, you know, if you look at two points that are more than about order one distance apart. Okay? Uh, so that's what the short range correlations here mean. Um, Okay, so if you write this as a graph, right, so evolution of graph, then you get the following. Okay, so you have a DTU, 
Um, so now X would just be this coordinate here, right? And then here you would have a, this would be U of X T and T is time, right? And so that guy is going to sort of move up uh, and start to fluctuate. Uh, so you get this term that comes from the classical mean curvature flow, right? So that sort of looks like that with probably a number of you are familiar with. And then the, um, um, the sort of order one, right? So we have an additional term, which is one plus square root of epsilon times the, uh, the noise. Uh, and that comes with a prefactor that's square root of one plus dxu square. Right? And so here you have a one plus square root epsilon uh, and eta is evaluated at x and u of xt. Right, so that's the equation. Um, the reason why you have that term here, right, is because if you, if you go back to here, if you have a certain slope at a given point, right, that speed one is a speed one sort of in the normal direction, in this direction here, whereas we're looking at the graph. And so you have to sort of project this uh, into the, uh, onto the vertical axis. Um, and when you do that, you get a term like that, okay? Um, so now, um, okay, so this is what the equation that we're going to look at. And so the first question here, of course, is what is, right? So I, I told you that we're interested in, um, looking at what happens at kind of large scales. And so the first question is sort of how large is large, right? So, so there's a spatial scale that's going to show up. There's a time scale that's going to show up. Naturally the spatial scale and the time scale should be related. One should be the square of the other one essentially because of the parabolic scaling that comes from the fact that this looks sort of like a heat equation here. Um, and one thing is we should also somehow remove the average behavior, right? On average, uh, the interface is just going to move up at speed of order one, right? And so a natural thing to do is to write U, um, so u of x t as t, which is just the, that's just the average behavior and then plus some fluctuation around it. And I claim that sort of the, so reasonable exponent to look at here is V of epsilon alpha x epsilon two alpha t, All right? So for the moment I keep an exponent alpha here, which I can still choose. So for any positive alpha, this corresponds to looking at what happens at large scales, right? Because I'm going to, if I look at the equation for V, that really means that I look at X uh, at scales of order epsilon to the minus alpha and on time scales of order epsilon to the minus two alpha. Um, and I claim that this is the natural uh, somehow amplitude exponent that goes with this, uh, that's going to give me some sort of non-trivial behavior. And the reason why, now the reason why I have the one half here, the one half here comes from the fact that, uh, so that's the one half, which is really that one half, right? The one half that comes from the square root epsilon. So this here suggests that locally the fluctuations are going to be of size square root of epsilon. But if we actually look at long as, at larger scales, uh, what's going to happen is that your fluctuations on sort of large scales, there's going to be some sort of central limit theorem um, showing up and and so in this direction, 
your interface is essentially going to look like a Brownian motion after a while. It's sort of going to look like a random walk. So there's going to be some sort of central limit theorem. Um, and that's why you have this additional alpha over two, which is, you know, this alpha here, which is really the square root uh, of this factor here. Okay, and that comes from some type of central limit theorem. So I claim that this is a reasonable, the reasonable scaling to look at uh, in the sense that this is going to be the natural size of the fluctuations at these scales. Okay, but for the moment, alpha is a free exponent that you can sort of, you know, in principle, you can choose it. Uh, so let's just write down the equation for V that you get if you do that. Um, so, so now here you have a, a power of epsilon that shows up here. Um, now there's a power of epsilon that multiplies this whole thing. There's a one plus three alpha over two, which multiplies this square root of one plus epsilon to the one plus alpha. Again, the xv square. So that's similar term as the other one. There's a minus one. The minus one here comes from the fact that we've subtracted. The, uh, the average behavior, right? That minus one is really the minus one. That's the time derivative of that T. Um, and then we still have a term that comes from the noise uh, and that's an epsilon to the minus three alpha over two beta of X of epsilon to the alpha T of epsilon to the two alpha plus one minus alpha over two V. And then this whole thing is still multiplied by the same square root of one plus epsilon to the one plus alpha dxv squared. Okay, so you get something like that. Um, so the first thing that you see is that there's one value of alpha uh, which appears sort of special here, uh, which is alpha equal one, right? So at alpha equal one, this exponent here becomes zero. Uh, and that means that you actually start to, right? This is not a small perturbation anymore from this, right? So at alpha equal one, so that's already here, you see. So at alpha equal one is, of the exponent for which you would expect the fluctuations to actually be of order one over the scales that you're considering. Uh, for alpha less than one, this is still a positive exponent. Um, alpha equal one is also the exponent at which these two exponents cancel out, right? Because when alpha is equal one, then this is an epsilon square. And this is an epsilon to the minus uh, one plus four, uh, one plus three, which is four over two. So it's a minus two. Okay, so then this minus two just balances up this plus two here. Um, and so alpha equal one is also the point at which, you know, if you perform some sort of Taylor expansion of this term, um, the first contribution, right? So like there's a zero order term here, which is the one which cancels out with the one here. And then there's a first order term, which would be essentially this times a half. Um, and alpha equal one is the point where that exponent balances up that exponent, right? Uh, so it's kind of clear that alpha, there's something interesting that's going to happen at alpha equal one. Um, and so that corresponds to looking at the original problem on spatial scales of order one over epsilon uh, and time scales of order one over epsilon square, right? Uh, now, if alpha is less than one, what do you expect? So that's the easier case, right? So if alpha is less than one, 
uh, you'd expect, you can formally just tailor expand everything here, right? So if you just pretend that you're allowed to tailor expand, um, then if alpha is less than one, all of these terms are essentially going to disappear. That term is going to disappear. That one, even if I assume that this is of order epsilon to the one plus alpha, it cancels this exponent here is smaller than that one. Uh, and so in some sense, this whole thing formally disappears. This is a positive exponent. So this also formally disappears. This formally disappears. Basically everything disappears. The only thing that's left is a heat equation here um, and the noise at with this scaling. And this scaling is chosen in such a way, right? So this was why we, that's another reason why we choose this specific uh, power of epsilon in front of V here, which is that then this gives you a noise that scales with this exponent being three half, well, being the sum of these exponents divided by two. Uh, and again, the two is a, you know, the central limit theorem sort of two. Um, and this is precisely the scaling under which this guy here converges to white noise, right? So it's descaling under which the correlation function of this guy converges to a delta function in space time, okay? Because if you take the correlation, then it would, in X, it gets scaled by epsilon to the alpha, in T, it gets scaled by epsilon to the two alpha, and the height of your correlation gets scaled by epsilon to the three alpha. Right, or epsilon to the minus three alpha, because it's the square of that. Um, and so it scales like a delta function, okay? So that suggests that if alpha is less than one, right, so the, the easy guess, if you want, is that if alpha is less than one, then one has that the V I'll say, let's call that guy sort of V epsilon, right? Then V epsilon converges as epsilon goes to zero to some limit V. Uh, and the limit V should just be the solution to the heat equation plus space time white noise, right? Where the expectation of psi of xt, psi of ys. It's just delta of x minus y, delta of t minus s. All right, so that's what you would guess uh, from just formally dropping everything in this equation that has an epsilon. So this drops, this drops completely, this drops, and this just becomes a one. And then you have this guy, which, which has a correlation that converges to a delta function, right? Um, so the theorem, here is that the guess is correct, uh, correct for alpha less than a third. Uh, and it's almost correct for alpha between a third and one. Um, and what I mean by almost correct is that actually for alpha between a third and one, the epsilon itself doesn't converge as epsilon goes to zero, but all you have to do is shift it down a little bit. Okay, so what happens is that for alpha between a third and one, uh, so, okay, so almost correct for alpha between a third and one in the sense that um, what you have to look at is actually the epsilon minus some constant times epsilon to the one minus three alpha uh, over two um, times T. And then this guy converges to B in general. And of course you see that if alpha is less than a third, and this exponent here is positive. And so having this guy converge to V is the same as having the epsilon itself converge to V. Uh, but if alpha is bigger than a third, then uh, this exponent here is negative, right? And so there's still uh, an additional term that shows up here. Now, so the reason why this term shows up 
uh, is relatively easy to understand. Well, at least why something like something has to show up. Um, because you can you can figure out here from well, if you just you know ignore all of these terms and just look at the heat equation driven by this guy here, um, well, then that's a Gaussian process. You can compute anything you want. And in particular, you can figure out how large the derivative of V is going to be. Okay? And actually what you find is that the derivative of V epsilon is going to be of size um, of order um, now let me oh, lost my note. So that's going to be of order uh, epsilon to the minus alpha over two, something like that. Right. Um, and then what you find is that, well, this term here, right? You can figure out how large this term is. So it's still small because the minus alpha over two essentially kills the alpha here. So this is still an order epsilon. Uh, but by the time it gets multiplied by this epsilon to the minus one plus three alpha over two, uh, well, you see that this actually diverges, right? So this term here, which we've neglected actually diverges as soon as alpha is bigger than a third. Right, because a, a third is precisely the case where this exponent is one, uh, and then the epsilon to the minus one here balances up the epsilon to the plus one you get from here, right? And so that's because, well, that dx v square is not actually of order one, but it's actually of order epsilon to the minus alpha. Right? So, so that immediately tells you why, in some sense, the naive calculation or you know, the naive sort of heuristic actually breaks down already at alpha equal to a third. Yeah. Um, and so the claim is that still all the way between a third and one, even though the heuristic is not quite correct, well, it's almost correct in the sense that the only trouble that you, you know, the only thing you have to take into account is that there's an additional so of constant drift. So if, if you want the average speed uh, is slightly off from what you would expect. So it's not quite one, but it's one plus, you know, something like this. So this here is looks large because it's a negative power, but remember that this is for the V epsilon, which was at scale epsilon to the minus two alpha, right? So if you want the actual correction to the speed in the original variables, right, for the u, then it would be epsilon to the two alpha times that. And then that's a positive exponent, okay? So then that's a small correction if you want uh, to the order one average speed that you've got. Um, and the claim is that up to alpha equal to one, this is the only effect that you see, okay? So you just have this small correction to the average speed. Um, but other than that, you just converge again to the thing that you would sort of naively expect. Um, but the interesting case we've seen is actually alpha equal to one, right? So the alpha equal to one is the interesting case. And so what happens at alpha equal to one? Well, we've just seen alpha equal to one is the point at which even formally uh, this exponent here just balances up this exponent here, right? And so, we, and that's the only one that somehow survives, right? I mean, like the other exponents are still positive. Um, and so what you expect there is that formally you should converge not to the solution to this stochastic heat equation, but you should converge to a solution to the KPZ equation, which is that equation plus an additional quadratic term, right? And that's what you do. So the, um, and again, in general, well, again, this is almost true, 
Um, and so what is actually true is that if, so if eta is isotropic, so say, it, you know, it respects the symmetry of the two dimensional plane, uh, in particular, so rotation and reflection symmetries, um, then if you look at V epsilon minus suitable constant times T, so there exists a constant C epsilon, so that if you look at V epsilon minus C epsilon times T, this again converges to a limit, say H, uh, and H is the solution uh, to the KPZ equation, psi, where this is as before, that's your space-time white noise. Um, but this equation itself is problematic. It's not clear what it means to be a solution to that equation, but there is a standard notion of solution uh, where the solution is in the Kohlhoff sense. Right, so in the sense that, you know, formally, if you write um, h equal to say log z, uh, okay, maybe maybe there's constants a half somewhere. Actually, actually here there would be a constant a half, right? Sure enough, because uh, the expansion of the square root gives you a one half, right? The first order expansion of the square root. So there's really a one half here then maybe, maybe I have to put a half in front of the log Z here. I don't know, I'm not sure. There's some, some correct, if you look at, if you take the correct constant C here um, and you formally write down the equation for Z, then you get DTZ equal to DX squared Z plus Psi times Z, right? Uh, and then this equation here, you can give it a meaning because this guy is white noise. And so you, you can interpret, if you write this in integral form, you, you can interpret this as a Wiener integral or as a sort of standard stochastic integral. And then you can just define the solution to this equation as being the log of the solution to that equation. Okay, so that's one way of defining it. Um, it's, it's a slightly dodgy definition because the this is a interpreted as a Wiener integral. Um, that means that normally when you do change of variables, you should have a sort of eta, you know, there should be an eta correction term, right? Whereas here you just did it formally as if there were as if the regular chain rule applied. Um, if you try to figure out what the eta correction term would be then what you find is that the Eto correction term is sort of like an infinite constant that you'd have to subtract here. Okay, and that's what actually gives meaning uh, to this equation, even though in the solution to this equation, they are not differentiable, so this term here diverges. Okay, but there is a completely standard, if you want, notion of solution, and the claim is that you converge, if you choose that constant C epsilon in the right way, um, and it blows up sort of like one over epsilon and then there are lower order corrections, uh, then you have this convergence. In general, right, so here there was an assumption that eta is isotropic, um, which again, doesn't show up in the formal derivation, right? Um, and actually what happens if eta is not isotropic, so in general, there exists a constant mu uh, in R such that what you have to do is you look at V epsilon, not of T and of X T, but of X minus mu T T. Okay, so in general, you actually have to put yourself into a slightly a sort of into a moving frame um, in order to get convergence to KPZ, right? So you have this additional uh, constant mu showing up. Okay, so 
now I've got about ooh, 10 minutes left. So, so let me try to explain. Okay, so first, for example, what, how comes that there is this constant mu here, right? Which seems sort of slightly strange. Um, that basically comes from resonances between various terms showing up in this equation. In particular, it basically comes from a resonance between the noise term here and this quadratic term uh, in the solution here. Okay, so the additional, uh, this additional sort of speed uh, new that you have to sort of take into account. Yeah, it's basically a resonance between this term here and the, and the noise term that shows up in the equation. Um, so what this shows you, right? So this already shows you that if you want to be able to get a convergence result like that, it's clearly going to be quite delicate because the solution is going to over the, there are really quite large sort of time scales and spatial scales you're looking at, right? Um, and over these scales, the fluctuations of the solutions are not that large, right? So they end up just being somehow of order one on the scales that you're considering. Um, but, but sort of the resonances that get created between, between these fluctuations, they are sort of sufficiently large so that over time scales of order epsilon to the minus two, you know, they can easily build up to very large effects. Right? And the claim is that all of these effects can actually just be taken into account by these two constants here. Right, where one of the constants diverges, but it's still just a constant and you can in principle more or less compute it explicitly. And then there's this other constant, which actually remains of order one uh, as epsilon goes to zero. And again, there's an explicit expression for that in terms of the, uh, in terms of the covariance of the noise. Um, okay, so, so what are the, so let me, now just try to give you some sort of idea of what the, uh, what the main problems are. So the thing is, okay, so the way we want to prove this type of convergence result, right, is, well, now we have that sort of quite general theory of regularity structures, which basically, you know, gives you almost for free convergence results that are roughly of that type, right? So they ba it basically, it's sort of a quite general theory that tells you that, you know, if you've got a semi-linear equation with some noise and there's some power counting going on, so it needs to satisfy some subcriticality condition. Um, so if that condition is satisfied, uh, then, there's a pretty general way of saying, well, maybe you, you may have to modify the equation a little bit. So you may have to add some addition, some counter terms to the equation, but if you add the right counter terms, then it's actually going to converge to a limit. Uh, and the limit is sort of well posed in the sense that it doesn't really depend on regularizations and things, okay? So we have this quite general theory, um, but so the problem we're looking at here doesn't quite fit uh, into that general theory. And sort of there's a number of reasons why it doesn't quite fit. So first it's quasi-linear uh, and not semi-linear. That's, so for that, there is now, there has been quite a lot of work recently on quasi, extending the theory to quasi-linear equation. Uh, so in particular, there was some early work by Furlan and Gubinelli, and there was work by Felix uh, together with a number of people like Hendrik Weber, Sauer, Smith, Linares, Templemeyer. Um, and there's also some work by Mati Garantia and myself. So, so the theory does sort of extend to quasi-linear equations, but it, it gets quickly quite messy. And so if you can avoid that, uh, you really sort of want to avoid it. Um, the other problem, which is somewhat related, is that the power counting 
um, doesn't, at least if you sort of look at the equation um, as it's written at the beginning, it doesn't quite look subcritical. Uh, so that power counting, it's not completely clear whether that works out. Uh, and then there's sort of two more serious problems, which is that uh, the solution itself appears as argument of the noise. And that the, you know, the theory wasn't quite designed with that kind of situation. So it was always sort of like the kind of equations we always had in mind were building the theory was that the noise is sort of given externally um, and it's sort of just given on the state space of the solution a priori. Whereas here, the way we're rewriting things, the noise is evaluated at a point that depends on the solution itself. Um, and then the, the last problem that you end up with is that the, right, so I mentioned that the, the general theory tells you, gives you convergence results of that type, but modulo modifying the equation by adding certain counter terms. Um, and then these counter terms in general are not just constants, right? So we don't want sort of non-constant counter terms. All right, so what I mean is that the claim Right, so the claim is that you have convergence of this guy. And that basically means that the only modification to the equation that you're allowed to do uh, is to subtract here, sort of to the right hand side, this constant C epsilon, right? Because, um, well, even this is not quite the same, right? Because if you subtract the constant C epsilon, here you have the V itself showing up, right? So even here, if you can subtract the C epsilon, this isn't quite the equation for V epsilon minus CT, right? It's almost, because in all the terms here, you only always have spatial derivatives of V showing up, but here you actually have V itself. Um, that's something you can kind of deal with quite easily. So, so basically, what we're saying is that if we subtract here the correct constant, then we can make sure that this converges uh, as epsilon goes to zero. But if you plug it into the general theory, that would sort of want to subtract terms uh, that involve, you know, maybe the derivative of V or something uh, in various ways, right? And we don't want to have these terms showing up. Um, So let me, okay, so let me just give you in the last couple of minutes of just a very quick idea of what's, what sort of tricks we're using uh, to circumvent these problems. So to circumvent that, we use a sort of very simple trick, which is that we actually define, so that, that's a very simple trick, uh, which is we define sort of hi to be epsilon to the two i over three v uh, for i zero up to three actually. And then we rewrite the original equation as a system of equations uh, for h zero up to h three. Okay, well, of course you can do that. Um, now, what, what does it buy you? Right. So what it what it buys you is that um, when you look at your system at the system of, of equation for the H's, well, you know, the equation for the HI is essentially, you know, they all look more or less the same. And you just end up multiplying the right hand side by epsilon to the two I over three. But then, you know, it it's up to you to choose how to interpret, you know, whether to write these guys as H zeros or H ones or H twos, et cetera. Um, and so you rewrite it in such a way that first the equation actually, that all the equations look semi-linear rather than quasi-linear. Because what you do is like in the equation for H zero, 
you write this guy in terms of H1, and in the equation for H1, you write this guy in terms of H2. Um, oh, rather, sorry, this guy here. So, so you write this, basically you write this as a sort of the time derivative of HI as second derivative of HI times one, and then plus something like second derivative of HI plus one uh, times something that depends on the, the other derivatives of H, right? So you essentially turn it into sort of an equation that looks much more semi-linear in the sense that it has a sort of triangular structure. Um, and you just have sort of these derivatives of the other H's showing up. And then the last term in the equation is going to be written sort of the H3 is going to be written as a quasi-linear equation, but the H3 is going to be so small. And sort of there's a balance between size and regularity in this business. So basically we interpret the different H's as being more and more regular in space. Uh, and the last guy is going to be sufficiently regular uniformly in epsilon so that you can actually deal with it in a sort of, you can get a priori estimates on it in a sort of classical sense. Uh, you don't need this whole theory of regularity structures for the last component of the equation. Right, sort of like these guys get multiplied by pretty large powers of epsilon. So it gets easier and easier to control them if you want. Um, and so that turns out to be actually quite useful uh, in order to rephrase the equation in a way that's sort of more appropriate for the theory. Um, and then in some, one big problem is sort of the fact that the solution here appears as uh, argument of the noise. And the way we deal with it is a sort of similar way to the way in which you know, people have dealt with the quasi-linear case in the sense that we look at infinite dimensional sort of regularity structures where in some sense you view the equation as being driven by a whole collection of noises which are all the possible order one shifts of the noise. And then when you look at your local expansions of the solution, you have to sort of choose the correct shift uh, at whatever location you're currently looking at. Uh, and that worked quite well, works quite well in the quasi-linear case where one looks at, in some sense, different heat kernels parametrized by sort of like different constants in front of the heat kernel. And here instead you look at sort of different noises that are parametrized by shifts. Um, and that works quite well. And then the last problem is this sort of these non-constant counterterms. And that, that essentially gets, essentially what happens is that once you've solved the analytic problems of which a large number sort of, you, you know, you use enough tricks to basically coerce it into this sort of black box kind of theory that does the analysis and the probability for you, uh, then basically everything turns into a sort of algebra problem uh, where the question then is, can you fix the equation in such a way that um, the counter terms generated by the theory have the effect that the corrected equation is actually the equation that you want to solve, maybe modulo minus some large constant appearing on the right hand side. Okay, and then for that, well, that's some kind of relatively messy sort of calculations, but you can actually show that this is the case, okay? And so eventually uh, you sort of, you know, you put all the pieces together and you manage to get the sort of results that, uh, that I just mentioned earlier. Okay, so I think this is probably a good place to stop. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, if there are any questions? So. Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I don't know, it's customary to use reactions and use the clap, but I don't see the reaction button in Zoom. But <laughs> regardless, if there are questions, feel free to unmute uh, and ask.
well, 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 everyone else is unmuting. Uh, I had a quick question. Um, uh, does this make sense if you look at it in higher dimensions? So if I looked at a surface and then did this mean curvature thing with noise, yeah, uh, well, the question certainly makes sense, um, and it's uh, and it's very interesting. Uh, it's much less. It, it's not so clear what you expect. So the thing is, so of course, okay, that type of result, uh, you know, like a result analogous to that one. Oops, that was the wrong. <laughs> Uh, so a result analogous to this kind of result that we could probably obtain in any dimension, but okay, maybe the upper limit, uh, probably one dimension up, we could, could probably still go up to alpha equal one. Um, but then if you go to even higher dimensions, we probably couldn't. I mean, there would be like an upper limit, which would get lower somehow. Uh, that sort of result in higher dimension, it's not clear at all what it would even mean because that, that so the KPZ equation doesn't have a meaning in higher dimensions, right? So in two dimensions, there's been quite a bit of recent results by, so there's been work by uh, people like Toninelli, uh, Canizaro, and Erhardt, and Schoenbauer, and so on. Um, in trying to show that, you know, trying to give some form of meaning to that equation in dimension two, and there's sort of additional log corrections that actually show up. Um, and it's not complete, I mean, it's not terribly well understood, right? So, yeah, and then in higher dimensions, you actually expect, so there, there are theorems that basically tell you that even, you know, if you try to actually take approximations to that equation, so that's also relatively recent results by people like Dunlop and Zaituni and so on, which tell you that if you take that equation, you try to regularize it, you know, and pass to the limit, uh, that term still kind of disappears. So you actually don't manage to get any limit, which is not the same as simply the heat equation. Uh, the noises of the stochastic heat equation, right? In the sense that that term would always disappear. It doesn't disappear in the sense that it completely disappears. It, the effect of this term is to actually change like the constant in front of the, the Laplacian and the constant, the variance of the noise. Okay, so it still has an effect, but you still end up just with a stochastic heat equation, just with somehow different coefficients. Um, so you would expect something like that to actually happen, that you would basically always see Gaussian fluctuations in the higher dimensions, uh, but that would be much harder to prove. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, I see Guichan is unmuted. Did you have a question? Oh, oh you asked me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, yeah, Martin, this, uh, this kind of problem, uh, what about this kind of invent measure? Is it possible to uh, address such, such kind of issue about uh, asymptotic? Yeah, so so that so for the um, uh, the KPZ equation, one knows the invariant measure. So the invariant measure yeah. is just a Run in motion actually. Right, right. Like, right. Yeah. Um, for, right. The, for the actual problem one starts with, one probably wouldn't expect to have an invariant measure because if you write, I mean, you could imagine that there would be, right, there will be fluctuations in the noise that do anything you want if you wait for long enough. And then right. at some point it would just break the property of that being a graph, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so you wouldn't actually you would expect in of that, that equation you would expect to actually have it blow up at some point right before. Uh -huh. um, but right so that's sort of part of the theorem is that it actually you know up to times of order epsilon to the minus two it remains a graph right? yeah uh, with high probability mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
for high dimension even more complicated. <laughs> oh yeah, in higher dimension, right. <laughs> <laughs> And then Robin, did you want to say something? Or... We couldn't hear you. At least I can't hear you. I can't hear either. Still no. Uh, maybe you can increase your mic volume. Uh, uh, still can't hear. <laughs> Try the chat, maybe. <laughs> While Robin is figuring this out, does anyone else have? Sorry. Ah, here you go. It works. We can hear you now, Robin. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead and ask. Oh, I see. Okay, so I was wondering whether there was any analogy with the maximum principle uh, associated with uh, this work. Um, well, so there is a, because the maximum principle for the mean curvature flow, but we don't actually exploit the maximum principle here. So, uh -huh. yeah, so th there is, and there is also a maximum principle for KPZ, which is a bit more tricky because of the, you know, lack of regularity and so on, but it does satisfy a maximum principle. Um, but yeah, so in this, uh, in this work, we don't exploit the maximum principle at all, actually. Right. <clears throat> so how, how does the, the, the magnitude of the, um, the solution compare with its initial value as time. Uh, so you would want, okay, so I didn't really mention uh, initial conditions here. Um, so, so of course, right, the way I presented it, we should just th think of the initial condition as being completely flat and it's just zero. Um, in, we can also deal with sort of non-constant uh, or non-flat initial data then what we need is we need the initial data to be very regular at this scale, um, I don't know, like C7 or something ridiculous like that. Um, and we need it to have the right. So, so there's a convergence as epsilon goes to zero and you're sort of rescaling things. And so you want to look at, if you want sequences of initial data that converges to something non-trivial as you rescale, right? Um, and so the, so what you want is you want your initial data to be very smooth at this scale, but it's allowed to rescale to something that, so it should rescale to some value, your sequence of initial data should rescale to something which is order one at, you know, sort of on this scale here. Um, and the limiting guy is allowed to be relatively irregular. Right, so that one is allowed to actually look like a Brownian motion because that's what you actually expect for the initial data. And that's, uh, that's actually important in the proof because you want to exploit, right? So the actual convergence results that you get quite easily are sort of local in time, but up to some random, random possible explosion time or something. And so you want to exploit the fact that you know a priori that the KPZ equation itself has global solutions. And so you want to use that in order to actually get a convergence results on sort of order epsilon to the minus two scales, you know, without having to have some kind of weird random stopping time or something. Uh, and so for this, you have to be able to restart things uh, and you can do that. So if the result ends up being formulated in such a way that you can restart things for initial data that's good enough to be able to exploit the fact that this guy has global solutions to sort of track them. Right. <clears throat> okay, thanks.